Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks. And in this video, I'm going to show how to measure the transfer function of a given device under a test with the ultimate goal of extracting the impulse response. This video is going to involve a combination of a simulate model that you see before you, and then some background code, which is going to our MATLAB code, which is going to convert the um, computed or measured transfer function to an impulse response. So. Uh, a little background in this model, I'm using a digital filter block in Simulink to model the device under test. In this case, it's modeling a lossy channel with reflections. So this would be uh, for the application of CERTES, signal integrity application. I have a transfer function estimator block, which is generating some excitation, uh, broadband excitation. In this case, I'm using the, this uh, signal from workspace block and it is generating a PAM3 signal or outputting a PAM3 signal. That is going to be my reference channel. And then the response channel is going to be whatever comes out of the digital filter block modeling the lossy channel. From that, I'm going to, under this block, it's going to compute the transfer function or the frequency response. And I'm going to break that into the magnitude and phase and display it. So that's the simulink portion of the job. I'll go ahead and run this model. Uh, the magnitude response is on top. You can see it. The phase is on bottom. And from that, after the simulation is complete, I have computed two things. I have computed uh, the uh, impulse response on top, and that would be uh, and overlaid it with the actual uh, impulse response or original impulse response. And then I have the same for the pulse response. The computed or derived pulse response overlaid with the original uh, pulse response. Uh, so that's the entire job here in one. Uh, the goal now is to step back and look at how all this took place. In this model, if we go back to the model, I have uh, two, uh, uh, two hyperlinks or two annotation callbacks on the model, one for the preload function, one for the stop function. These are just shortcuts. You don't actually need these in the model. They just help you get to uh, the files that are associated with the model easier. Uh, the preload function, what it does is it creates the uh, channel. It creates essentially the uh, filter coefficients for the channel. And it also creates the stimulus waveform. Okay, so in this case, I am actually using functionality from the CERTES toolbox. Um, but whatever you use, you could use any particular coefficients uh, to model whatever it is you want to model. Uh, that this just so happens to be modeling a, a lossy channel in this case. So again, I'm using CERTES functionality to model the device under test. I'm also using CERTES uh, toolbox functionality to model the stimulus, in this case, a PAM3 signal. It's not required uh, to have CERTES toolbox to model lossy channels or to model PAM3 signals. Uh, but it just so happens if you have that functionality, you can use it accordingly. Otherwise, you can generate these signals uh, using, you know, base MATLAB functionality. In this case, uh, I have a symbol time of 180 picoseconds, uh, but I have samples which are 16 times faster. The older sampling rate is 16. Uh, so the uh, TS is the uh, sample period. Okay, so 180 E12 divided by 16. Then I'm generating 300 symbols at this symbol time uh, with that same oversampling rate. And that's going to form my stimulus. I have that in a for loop at the bottom. So this is a system object. And that's why you see the step notation there applied to the system object stem. OK, so that's all for the preload function setup. Uh, at the end of the simulation, um, I am going to take the computed or measured frequency response, which I've logged. You notice the logging symbol and the output of the discrete uh, transfer function estimator block, the blue logging signal. I'm going to grab that signal and I'm going to call a stop function, this function literally called stop function. I'm going to grab that data, which is logged to the MATLAB workspace. I'm going to take the very last frequency response that it computed. So that should be the one that has the most averages applied to it, the final result, so to speak. I'm going to create a double-sided, from the single-sided actually log data, I'm going to create a 
double-sided spectrum version of it so that it's ready for inversion uh, via the inverse or IFFT operation. That is going to form my impulse response. So basically I'm taking the transfer function and uh, inverse FFT in that to get the impulse response. And then I'm gonna overlay that against the impulse response uh, that I started with that in back in the, uh, if I go back to the file, uh, the preload function, I extracted the, the, um, the impulse response uh, from that cha channel object, channel.impulse response. And so in the stop function, what I'm doing is I'm going to overlay what's the known impulse response against the computed impulse response. And then I, um, convert that impulse response to a pulse response. This is again, more functionality from the Surdy's toolbox um, because the impulse response is more theoretical where you assume you have this infinite, um, infinite uh, th this you would say infinitely high impulse of infinitely short duration of unit area, uh, a unit area impulse of basically zero time duration. And instead of that, you may want to have the unit pulse response, uh, which is what this function converts it to. Um, so that, that's more reflective of the actual signals you'll see in a system where you have a particular sample rate, particular sample time. Uh, again, this is something that you could also uh, just implement on your own. It, it essentially involves, we can, we can actually look at the code. We can open this up to go down to the bottom line. It, it consists of many circular shifts and summing of the impulse response. So you could think of this as an integration operation, discrete integration uh, operation where we're summing um, shifted versions of the impulse response to form the pulse response. And then of course, it's all scaled by the sample time DT. Okay, so that is the, uh, there's kind of some front end work again to, um, create the stimulus, create the device under test. There is some backend work to take the frequency response, which is computed in the model and convert that to an impulse response, and then we display it. So if we run this model one more time, we'll go through all the motions. Uh, again, this is our lossy slash reflective channel. You can see uh, the all the undulations, the periodic undulations and the response, so the magnitude response, phase response below. We take that, we form that double-sided version of it, essentially a symmetrical version of that. We inverse FFT it, and then we come up with the impulse response immediately from the inverse FFT. Uh, and then again, you can see sort of the reflective nature of this channel in the time domain. And then we can also convert that to the pulse response. That's when we take uh, shifted versions of that and add them to each other. And then the response becomes more, shall we say, squished or condensed, compressed uh, together. That's the pulse response. And again, for both of these, the ideal response is overlaid, but in this case, the derived is so close to the actual that it's hard to see unless you really, really zoom in uh, to them. You can see the same thing up here. If I zoom in, you can start to see some variation uh, between the two waveforms, but it's very, very close. Now, the one thing I really haven't covered or spent much time on the model is how um, these blocks work. How does the transfer function estimator block? How does the digital filter block work? Um, I've covered that in other videos, so I'll be very quick here. I'm going to dive under the hood of the block and just show you. It uses uh, the core of this block is the discrete transfer function estimator a block uh, from the, the, uh, the uh, can't think of it right now, the DSP system toolbox. And on this block, you just configure things like, well, how big is the FFT? How many averages you want to do? What type of averaging do you want to do? That sort of thing. Um, and then it computes essentially under the hood, it's computing a cross spectrum divided by an auto spectrum. And that's under the hood of this block right here. That's all actually in system object form. You don't see a block diagram of that. You see the excitation. Uh, you could use a random noise source if you wanted to a broadband or in this case because the actual application would have a pan 3 signal instead of using it wouldn't have access to a random noise source 
so I used, I, I generated that um, PAM3 signal as the broadband source of excitation and drove that into the reference input of the discrete transfer function estimator. Then what you see over to the right is just breaking that frequency response into magnitude and phase separation, and then plotting that on the spectrum analyzer blocks where the input domain is set to frequency uh, domain input. So if you haven't seen the updated spectrum analyzers in 23A, that's what I'm showing this in. Uh, that's something to be aware of that these blocks do have different input domains. In this case, you can see it's set up to frequency domain. The default view is time domain, so just be aware of those two. If you have it in time domain mode, the block itself computes the FFT, does all the averaging. If you have it in frequency domain mode, then the block is not doing the uh, FFT or filter band computation. That's being done externally uh, by another, uh, by assumed another external block. And then we're just presenting the results to the spectrum analyzer block. Uh, finally, for the digital filter uh, block, which is again modeling the lossy channel, we can double click on it. We can see that it just uses the impulse response coefficients that I derived using CERTI's toolbox functionality. Again, you're free to use any impulse or any, any type of coefficients you want. They can even be IIR filter descriptions as well. In this case, I just happen to be using an FIR uh, filter description for the channel. I've implemented it in direct form. In this case, you would need to either use direct form or direct form transpose because this is not a symmetric or anti-symmetric filter, which is going to be quite obvious when you click on the view filter response button. And you're going to see, uh, first of all, the magnitude response, uh, which is what the same as what we measured over here. Uh, also, we can view it in different modes. What's handy about this is you can look at the impulse response. Um, this, of course, is what we saw that we derived, but this is um, this is the given. Uh, this is what we're how we're describing the device under test, and then we're trying to derive this after the fact as if we didn't have this a priori knowledge. But in any case, you can see that this is not a symmetric or anti-symmetric uh, filter implementation. So you can't use the other filter structures um, under here besides direct form and direct form transposed. All right, that is about all on this video. I hope you find it helpful uh, if you're ever uh, faced with the challenge of extracting the impulse response, given that you only have time domain input and time domain output measurements, uh, hopefully uh, broadband enough in nature to excite um, the full range of your device under test. Thank you.